The V8 Speed and Resto Shop team has made huge progress on our 1957 Thunderbird project. The goal is classic Thunderbird style with power and performance to match. So I'm working on our 57 Ford Thunderbird project. Uh, right now I'm about to lay the engine harness on our 5.0 Coyote crate engine. Uh, kind of to pick up where we are on this car. Uh, this is a kind of was a restored 57 Thunderbird. Pulled the body off the original chassis. Body's now sitting on aftermarket tube chassis. It's got a Mustang tube based front end, a four link and a nine inch in the back. Uh, we've done some modifications to the car, make sure that everything fits. Uh, we've moved the brake booster over, made motor mounts, had to move a couple body mounts around because it's an aftermarket chassis. Made our bumpers fit. Uh, so from here, we're just trying to make sure our major components have brackets made, holes drilled, that sort of thing. Now there's a bunch of considerations when doing a drivetrain swap, right? Especially if you're going to a modern version that is also encompassing electronics and fuel injection. In the simplest terms, for the engine transmission to run, you need a fuel system of some sort, and you need a cooling system, transmission cooler, radiator, and an accessory drive, and power to the ECM, which in the most basic sense is a handful of connections. Um, this is all oversimplified, but it's overall not that difficult to get a Coyote to run in a swap application. A fuel injected engine has the uh, control module, it's got injectors, it's got uh, the different connections for the sensors, plus your transmission controller, and that might come in a, a standalone harness like this one did from Ford. So transmission control is handled by the ECM that runs the engine, so that's all internal to the same box. Um, so there's no extra controllers in this case. Uh, it all wires together off the harness that Ford Racing provides for the swap crate program. The rest of the wiring in this car predates Sputnik. So we didn't want to have that old stuff messing up our new stuff or the old stuff getting overburdened with higher loads and possibly causing a fire with a brittle old wire. So for safety and for uh, uh, install purposes, we chose to rewire the rest of the car. When you do a swap, it's easy to just take a, either a crate motor or a junkyard motor and the wiring harness and you just kind of toss the things in the hole and, well, the ECM landed here, so we're just gonna stick some screws through the bracket or make something out of, who knows, a piece of strap steel or angle iron. A lot of times you see these done with a, a takeout engine from a, a junkyard or a wrecked vehicle and you can do them pretty quickly if you just wanna get it in the hole, right? But that's not why people come to us. We like to make things look like they belong. This is a nice looking car, and our customer didn't wanna open the hood and see something that looked like it used to be in a Ford pickup truck with 150,000 miles on it. Uh, there has to be an aesthetic component to consider as well. Um, so in this case, we didn't cut the Ford harness, and it did kind of lay in a certain place, but conveniently, the original blower motor hole in the passenger fender land right there. So we mounted the ECM inside the fender well, made a nice cover over the original blower motor hole. So that looks nice. And then all the other wiring and plumbing, we try to run low and neatly tied up and clamped down. Um, so you're not seeing hoses and wires all over the place. And then uh, all the parts we make, we, we paint to match. Um, so everything looks basically like it was meant to be there from the start. So we always consider the aesthetics along with the engineering of making it work. And that means are we putting a, a custom finish on the engine? Are we painting the engine bay? Are we hiding wires and hoses, uh, routing the air conditioning lines and heater hoses in a clean manner? These are all things that we like to do. So that oftentimes requires kind of building the car twice. The first time you get the, in our case, we get the chassis under the car and had to make those mounts and cut the body and do our modifications. And then once everything is installed and it fits, we take it apart and then send it to our paint shop and they'll strip it and repaint it all with the proper finish. And then we put it together for the final assembly so that when you open the hood, you go, wow, that, that's integrated with the car. That looks like it's supposed to be there, not like it was just dropped in. And don't get me wrong, there's a place for those uh, you know, junkyard swaps. I've done it myself if the car 
doesn't really warrant having everything look nice under the hood, that's fine. Uh, but in this case, it had to look nice. Uh, we added a tilt steering column from Flaming River, which is a very nice convenience item. And the steering wheel is one of the high points, I think. And the owner picked the steering wheel. She saw it and loved it. Uh, she let us do the color scheme uh, because it kind of matches the car, the black on top and red on the bottom. But it's a very classic 50s looking steering wheel, but with a reduced diameter. So it's easier to get in and out of, especially with the tilt, it looks dynamite. The exhaust was kind of a challenge on this car. The way things were routed, we didn't have a lot of room in the back around that four-link suspension. So uh, Jay, our fabricator, actually used oval tubing, uh, which sits tighter to the body to run over the axle and then exit as far back as possible. Another thing to consider is keeping the beast cool. One of the number one rules of hot routing is put as much radiator as you can in something. Ultimately, we leaned it back far enough that we could nicely place the intake tube behind it and package it all well, made some brackets that hold the radiator up and also funnel the air from the grill and force it through the radiator because they meet up close to the hood. So there's very little wasted air coming through the grill on the car. Uh, it works really well. Uh, the car has a 195 thermostat in it. Uh, fans come on at 205 and I think the hottest I've ever seen it was 208 after a hard pull. So we couldn't upgrade the engine and the chassis on this car without addressing the brakes. And we started at the top with that hydraulic brake booster assist unit from Hydrotech, uh, which runs off the power steering pump. Uh, but also at the four corners, we used Willwood disc brakes. Um, their calipers are really nice. The rotors and the whole design uh, bolts right on to these Mustang two style spindles on the front and that Ford nine inch rear axle in the back. So we didn't have to do any fabrication or custom work to put the brakes on the car. But once that project was done, the payoff was in a, in a wonderful braking experience. The car brakes really, really well, stops with confidence, and uh, it's something that you're not afraid to drive fast because it stops. All right, so we finally have the 57 Thunderbird almost all the way back together. Still got some interior things to take care of, but it's on the chassis, it's got the Coyote in it. Uh, and just a couple minutes ago, I got the springs installed and set the ride height uh, to where the car looks right, and the shocks are in their travel where the manufacturer recommends. Uh, right now the car's staying level. Next couple things to do is uh, adjust the rear end geometry, get our pinion angle correct, so we have a drive shaft vibration, torque everything down while it's at ride height, and then we're gonna see how this drives. So these cars are never just the sum of their parts, right? I can't tell you how many cars we get in our shop where people have bolted things together that didn't play along and didn't give the performance result that they wanted because there is a lot of tuning time, a lot of chassis dialing in and finessing and changing spring rates and shock valving and sway bars and adjusting brake bias and all this stuff. So. When we went through all the parts, we did take some time to make sure they all work together, and this one really works well. So we have the 57 Thunderbird Coyote and chassis swap actually on the road now. Uh, I've got about, well, probably nine miles now. Uh, just feeling it out, figuring out where, where we need to pay attention on some adjustments, you know, if we're happy with the ride quality since uh, we set the baseline on the height and the shocks the other day. Uh, feeling out how the engine's running, if we need to do any adjustments to the tuning. Uh, but really, things pretty solid. Willwood disc brakes, Hydrotech Hydro Booster doing a great job stopping us. Six speed automatic shifting everything like it should. And uh, haven't really beat on it yet, but this thing's gonna be plenty powerful. Now this car looks cool, don't get me wrong, but I really think the best part about this car is the way it drives. It starts like a brand new car. The chassis is stiff but comfortable, right? It doesn't beat you up driving around. You could drive this car all day long or on a cross country trip and still be comfortable. And that's very important. 
But when you get into a high speed turn, it corners almost perfectly flat, which means it's enjoyable, you're not worried about it. Uh, the braking system is wonderful and it makes you feel like you've got control of the car. The steering is real nimble and it makes a ton of power. And it's a different kind of power. I mean, 460 horsepower might not sound like a lot, but you get yourself on an open road and put your foot to the floor. Now the old bird has some thunder. I, I had it up, I don't know, probably to 120 or so. It still pulls, it's great. It's neat to think that this car is really kind of a template for what we can do to just about any old car. With the right selection of chassis components, enough power, the right execution, design, and tuning, it doesn't matter if it's a 57 T-Bird like this, or maybe an old Cadillac, some big old Plymouth. You know, any cool car from the 50s or 60s can have modern car reliability, plenty of power, great handling, lots of comfort, and really satisfy that need that everybody wants. You know, it's, I want to drive a cool old car, but I don't want to deal with one. So I think this whole car is a win. It looks great. It uh, performs really well. Nothing looks out of place. It was all engineered to work together and it's a joy to drive. And although it's, you know, unfortunate that the owner's father can't be here physically to experience this car, we know that as she drives around, she's got him on her mind and she's now sharing this car with her own daughter. So if you think about it, you know, her father's passion for these Thunderbirds is now uh, influencing three generations of enthusiasts. And that's really what it's all about. They're all sharing those fond memories and making new ones with this awesome car.